Wonderful. Well, big thank you to everybody for joining us this evening. Um, my name's Robin Hansberger with Hansberger Physio Plus, and I have Sama Faramina with me, um, our newest registered physiotherapist. And we are going to be discussing treating incontinence without the meds. Um, so without further ado, we'll drive right in. It's taking its time. There you go. <laughs> there we go. Um, so today is International Women's Day. Um, and I thought it would be really is really important to recognize the amazing team of ladies uh, that we have at Hansberger Physio Plus. Um, so you can really tell who the strong women are. Uh, they are the ones you see building each other up instead of tearing each other down. Um, I personally am grateful for all of these intelligent, passionate, caring, supportive and beautiful women who truly make a difference in this world. Those who are on the screen, those are who are with us tonight, and those who I have the pleasure to interact with, both personally and professionally. Um, and I'd like to wish a in happy International Women's Day to everybody on the call, to your moms, to your sisters, to your girlfriends. Um, here's to strong women. May we know them, may we be them, and may we raise them. So cheers to all of you tonight, um, and thank you so much for joining us. Just a little bit about who we are uh, before I hand things over to Sama. Um, Hansberger Physio Plus is all about helping you feel better, live better, perform better, and work better. So whether you have a new injury, you wanna take your game to the next level, or you're just finding it harder to move than you used to, Hansberger Physio Plus can get you to your best you. So we will not only treat your current pain, but we will address the cause most importantly and empower you with the right plan for attaining long-term results you can celebrate. Now tonight really is about pelvic floor. So most importantly, um, we are going to really dive into how does a pelvic floor therapist help build a better you? And that's what Sama is here tonight to share with you. She's really put a lot of effort into this and I'm really excited to hear what she has to share. And just a few housekeeping items for everybody. Um, you are currently all muted. That being said, you can always unmute yourself to ask a question. You can raise your hand or you can type into the chat box. I will be monitoring that throughout the presentation. We may ask some questions as we go through. We will also have a question period at the end. And remember, there's no silly questions. This is a safe space. Um, so please feel free to ask anything that's on your mind. If anything isn't clear, uh, we'll be more than happy to answer that for you tonight. Sam, over to you, my girl. Thank you, Robin. All right. So Let's start with the uh, typical a little bit about me section. So a lot of you do know me, but for those who don't, I'm an athlete. I uh, swam for eight years. I cycle. I go to the gym. Um, it fits really well with the Hansberger philosophy of keeping people moving. I'm a Western grad two times over. I tried to leave, but they took me back. So I did go back for my master's as well. And then during my last year of my master's, I specialized in pelvic floor physiotherapy and so a little bit of how I got here, right? So I, mean, I kind of, I typed down a few of my favorite questions that some of my patients asked me because I think it dives in well into what I do, what I do and why I like it. So my favorite question is always, how did I end up in pelvic floor physio? Um, because when I started my master's um, and we talked about it, I was like, mm, don't think this is my thing. Like I definitely was not going into public floor physiotherapy. And then when the pandemic hit, I really wanted to find a way to gear my practice towards a population that is usually neglected. I really wanted to make an impact with my patients. And once I started to learn more about the benefits of public health, I really got sucked in. I loved it and I never looked back. I worked for a year in Owen Sound. I then decided Owen Sound was not for me. I wanted to be closer to my family, my network, and my fiance. So I came back home to the GTA and I looked for a clinic where I felt I would feel supported, but also learn loads. So that's how I ended up at Hansberger. You Finally, will definitely continue to learn loads. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love that one. That's yeah. great. Oh uh, gosh, I my brain is over overflowing with information for sure. Um, and finally, the favorite part of my practice is definitely my pregnant patients. I think pregnancy is amazing. Um, there's your body creates a human life, like that's insane. So, with no further ado, we're gonna go on to our first poll. So, for anyone who is anxious or concerned, um, polls are completely anonymous. Your answers will not be brought up on the screen. Um, so if you're worried about exposing your incontinence to the world, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, but 
we will start with the first poll today to just get a general idea of what people know about the pelvic floor, um, as well as to answer maybe some questions preemptively. So let's start. Uh, Robin, did it show up? No, uh, you'll have to go and launch the specific poll itself. Oh, relaunch poll. It didn't show up at the bottom. That's why. There we go. We're all good. And we'll give you guys a little bit of time to answer those questions. If anyone's done, do you want to write done in the chat so we know that you're finished? It also tells me how many people answered. So we oh, even better. We're at 19 out of 22. So we have. All right. Wonderful. Seeing a whole bunch of duns. I think it's fair to, uh, to close that poll if you like. All right. So we're going to share the results now. Again, don't worry, you guys still completely anonymous, but you guys should see now what the answer, what the most common answers were for everything, right? So do you cross your legs when you sneeze? Do you dribble a little when you cough and laugh? Do you avoid a trampoline at all costs? Yes, so 26% of you answered yes to that question, which is, you guys are gonna laugh later on in my PowerPoint. I have a little um, interesting fact about pelvic floor. One in four women, about 26% have incontinence. So you guys are pretty much on the money on that one. Um, how much do you know about pelvic floor physio? If you answered nothing at all, my pelvis has a floor. Don't worry, we will talk about it in length today. Um, and then you guys saw my little uh, clearly planted sneak attack question. So what do you think involves more drastic changes to the body, uh, an ACL tear or pregnancy? So pregnancy, I would agree with you guys 100%. And which do you think gets prescribed more rehab, an ACL tear or pregnancy? An ACL ding, 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 right? for sure. Um, which says a lot about our healthcare system and why I'm doing a webinar today because I really want us to talk more about the pelvic floor and what we can do to rehab it. So last but not least, do you think you have pelvic floor dysfunction? 37% uh, of you answered yes. We're going to try this poll again at the end and we're going to see if any of your answers change. All right. So Perfect. close that. You guys don't see it anymore, right, Robin? No, you're good. <laughs> All right. So what is the pelvic floor? Uh, now you're not going to switch sides. Okay. There you go. So the pelvic floor, it's a group of muscles that form a bowl, right? So the muscles, I'm trying to figure out if you guys can see me on the screen because I do have this model. Yeah, you're so, good. You can, you can see you with the model. Form of a bowl. Bleh. Muscles that form a bowl supports your bladder, uterus, and your bowel, so your pelvic organs, and therefore supports proper function of those organs. If you have weakness in your pelvic floor, if you have um, tension in your pelvic floor, that will directly impact your, your um, pelvic organs, your bladder, uterus, and your bowels. It also has a very important role in supporting your hips, your core, your back, and your breathing mechanics. And finally, it is intricately involved in pregnancy, labor, and delivery. So let's talk a little bit about proper bladder, uterus, and bowel function before we move on. We know that um, if you look at the bottom left corner of the picture, your, your bladder has a urethra that has to pass through your pelvic floor muscles. When your pelvic floor muscles engage, it allows your urethral sphincter to engage. If it doesn't engage properly, that's when you dribble, when you sneeze, cough, laugh, all those fun things. And um, when you talk about breathing mechanics and supporting um, the pelvic floor, supporting it that way, we look at the canister. So if you see my cursor on the slide there, you guys can see my cursor. Yes, yeah. maybe. All right. So you have your diaphragm at the top, your pelvic floor muscles, your core muscles, and then your back muscles that they form a nice canister. When you take a deep breath in, your diaphragm has to expand. It's going to shift down, allow your lungs to expand. 
And all your abdominal contents have to go somewhere as well. And they're gonna shift down towards your pelvic floor and cause a lengthening of your pelvic floor muscles. So pelvic floor and diaphragm, very intricately related. If you're not breathing well, that can have a huge impact on your pelvic floor as well. Did you know getting frequent bladder infections and UTIs is not normal? So I get a lot of patients who come in who will I'll ask them, do you have frequent bladder infections and UTIs? I say, no. Say, how many have you had? They'll say, oh, you know, three or four. Like, okay, most people go their whole life without UTIs and bladder infections. So UTIs and bladder infections can point to dysfunction in the pelvic floor. Uh, if you have too much tension, uh, improper bladder habits, improper uh, fluid intake, that can, that can contribute to, to UTIs as well and bladder infections and a pelvic floor therapist can help you with that. So quick facts about the pelvic floor and pelvic floor dysfunction. 26% of all women between the ages of 30 and 59 have problems with urine leakage. I'd like to point out that one in four is a lot, right? And you guys saw it in the poll, 26% of you described issues with urine leakage or incontinence. So we're right so, on the money there in terms of, yeah, the, right on I don't know money. if that's good or bad. Hopefully you can help us with that, Sama. We will definitely help you with that. So one in four is a lot though, right? If you think about it, if you don't have incontinence, but you know, you have a mom, you probably have a sister, you probably have a cousin who's female, at least one of them has incontinence. That's a lot of burden on the healthcare system. So pelvic pain in particular costs the healthcare system in Canada $25 million per year, but it is not well addressed. Hence the cost on the healthcare system. Quick question for you, Sama. In a man, um, is it the same statistic in terms of um, problems with urine leakage or does it show up differently? It's definitely not as prevalent in men um, for urine leakage because they don't have as many contributing factors to pelvic floor dysfunction. All right. Um, Adolescents with symptoms of endometriosis are 10 times as likely to miss school. So endometriosis, for those of you who aren't aware, is a, a painful disorder in which tissues similar to the tissue that normally lines the inside of your uterus, so the endometrium, grows outside the uterus. And that is very painful for a lot of women. A lot of women develop this in adolescence if they will develop it. And then they kind of start this cycle of chronic pain, right? They start having pain at a very young age that's not well addressed. And then your brain starts to expect pain in that area. And if it's not addressed at a, at a younger age, then you likely end up seeing a pelvic floor therapist or a gynecologist pretty regularly in your 30s, 40s, or 50s because of this constant pain in your pelvic floor that wasn't addressed as, as, as an adolescent. Finally, 10 to 15% of the male population suffers chronic prostatitis or chronic pelvic pain syndrome. So prostatitis would be an inflammation or enlargement of the prostate or infection. And it is, again, quite a big percentage of males who suffer from these conditions. And this is something that we can also treat with pelvic floor physio. Another fun fact, in many European countries, the parent who had the baby gets prescribed and compensated for physiotherapy after pregnancy because it has such an impact on your body, um, it's important to address the changes that women um, or parents go through after they have a baby. So what does pelvic floor dysfunction look like? It might look like urgency, constantly feeling like you need to pee throughout the day and barely being able to hold your bladder. It might look like getting up at night to pee and trying to keep your eyes closed so that you don't lose sleep. But a lot, of, a lot of people struggle with that and will get up three to four times a night because their pelvic floor isn't functioning as well as they should. And finally, it might look like back pain or hip pain. Back pain and hip pain are two big questions that we address when we talk about pelvic floor dysfunction because of its, um, because of, because of its role with the core, hip, back, and breathing mechanics. All right, so. This is a nice long list of things that you might experience if you have pelvic floor dysfunction. You might have dribbling when you cough, sneeze, laugh, or exercise. You might have an urgency to urinate so strong that you can't control it, i.e. Um, you open the bathroom door and you just can't get your pants off fast enough to go pee. Uh, you're urina urinating more than eight to 10 times a day. You're waking at night to urinate. You have difficulty emptying your bladder or starting the flow of urine. You have pain in or around the pelvis. You have a feeling of pressure down there. 
uh, low back, hip or tailbone pain, difficulty with bowel movements, pain with intercourse or insertion, and painful periods. Notice most of these are not limited to just women, right? Dribbling when you cough, sneeze, laugh, or exercise can happen to anyone. Um, urgency, urinating more than eight to 10 times a day, waking up at night, that can, that can happen to men and women. And I have a question for you, yeah. Samma. Um, does weight gain or loss influence the pelvic floor in any way? The studies for that are very back and forth. They have in the past suggested that weight gain can affect the pelvic floor, um, but oftentimes women who struggle with incontinence, who lose a lot of weight, that doesn't necessarily resolve itself just because they lost the weight. So they're kind of veering away from the idea that weight gain or weight loss can be impacting the pelvic floor. I would go, I would venture to say more that the exercises that women are doing or the way that the way that they're exercising, not just women, men as well, um, will be impacting the floor, the pelvic floor more than how much weight they're putting on or how much weight they're losing. So if we're talking, if we flip back to um, breathing mechanics and the lengthening of the pelvic floor muscles as you breathe in, um, if you're doing squats at the gym or you're lifting something heavy or you're lifting your 20 pound toddler off the ground and you're holding your breath as you do that. Remember when your breath was held in, your pelvic floor muscles are lengthened and now you're asking it to work as you're lifting. That's a lot of pressure on the pelvic floor. So if you're lifting a really heavy box, you usually keep your arms close to your body, not far away from your body. You wanna apply the same thing to your pelvic floor muscles. So I know I went on a tangent there, but yeah. Oh no, it's really good information because I think a lot of us, we may have a few of these not necessarily in order, or we may have them at different times and not realize that they're all related to pelvic floor dysfunction. So I think a list like this, at least personally for me, is really um, useful to look at because you don't always realize they're together. Yeah, and, and I like breaking it down this way as well because I have a lot of um, people that I assess that I'll ask them if you, they have incontinence and then say no right away. And then I ask them if they dribble when they cough, sneeze, laugh, or exercise. And I'm like, oh yeah, I do that. I'm like, okay, that's incontinence, right? So breaking it down like this just makes it a little bit easier for people to relate to as well. So I agree. And everybody, one. just so you know, we will be sharing this with you afterwards. So you can look back and kind of review more and reflect on how this really impacts you as well. If, if it's uh, a lot to absorb at one time. Yeah. And finally, the big one that I get um, is this. If you refuse to jump on a trampoline, then you probably have pelvic floor dysfunction. So let's look at a little bit at the causes of pelvic floor dysfunction. So I've broken it down into four sections or categories. So muscular trauma, lifestyle, or pregnancy. And I, I want you guys, so when we look at it this way, I want you to look at my arrows, the way that they're pointing. What I really wanted to say here is that all of these things are related. And just because you have a muscular issue doesn't mean you don't have trauma. doesn't mean you don't have a lifestyle change that's affecting your pelvic floor. It doesn't mean that the pregnancy is unrelated to all these things. So all of these things can be interrelated. For example, if we look at muscular changes or issues, we could have too much tension in our pelvic floor. So often when people think of the pelvic floor, they think of Kegels and they think they need to strengthen it. But sometimes people have tension in their pelvic floor. The same way you can carry tension in your shoulders, you can carry, carry tension in your pelvic floor muscles, especially if you're really stressed or anxious or prone to stress and anxiety. Now, let's say your lifestyle, you again are prone to stress or anxiety that can promote tension in the pelvic floor. So all these things are really related. So anyways, back to muscular. You have too much tension in your pelvic floor muscles, we have to teach them how to lengthen. Then we won't do Kegels for someone like you. Um, maybe you don't have enough coordination of your pelvic floor muscles. Maybe you just had a baby and you had a lengthening or a lot of pressure on your pelvic floor muscles during your pregnancy. And now you just can't quite relate to your pelvic floor muscles anymore. You're, you're telling your brain to engage them and you're just you're not sure what's going on. So you're not getting enough coordination. Uh, maybe you have lack of muscle strength. Maybe you're perimenopausal or menopausal. Um, maybe you're, for men, you know, in your 60s or 70s, you've had a, a surgery around your pelvic floor or around your abdomen. And now you're lacking that muscle strength. 
And maybe you have improper biomechanics. So biomechanics, again, we go back to the breathing, but we also look at your posture. So if we think of um, people who are more arched in the lower back, they're tilting forward, they're pushing their bladder right over forward towards their pubic bone, that can affect pelvic floor dysfunction. Maybe they're carrying their weight in their, on one side more than the other all the time, which most of us do. We carry our weight on the right side versus the left side or vice versa. Now we're gonna create tension through our hip muscles and two of our hip muscles actually are pelvic floor muscles. So if we have tension or pain in our hip that can contribute to pelvic floor dysfunction. I never really thought about holding tension in my pelvis cause I usually hold it in my shoulders. But when you sort of explain it that way about sort of anxiety and overall tension, it makes a lot more sense. Yeah, so when you think of fight or flight, um, if you're being chased by a lion, you're not gonna think of eating or going to the washroom. So you kind of tense everything up. Um, and people don't think about it until we make them do exercises that promotes pelvic floor muscle lengthening. And then they're like, oh yeah, I can feel the difference between tension in my pelvic floor versus um, a release in my pelvic floor. Now I have a quick question for you from someone in the chat. Yeah. So can the dysfunction change over time without intervention? Do the symptoms come and go, or is it always going to be the same? Okay. Good, good loaded question. Symptoms. Don't don't, sorry. We can also put that on. No, no, that's, a, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, the symptoms could definitely change throughout based on some people will self-treat themselves and not in a bad way. Some people will notice that their lifestyle isn't quite where they want it to be. And they start doing yoga and yoga is great because it does a lot of hip opening exercises. And for someone who's really stressed all the time, who decides to take up yoga, then they might be treating their pelvic floor without even realizing that they're treating it. So like any other part of our body, sometimes we're intuitive in how we address it. If you realize that you need to pee all the time and you're like, I'm just going to stop drinking coffee. Well, if you were coming in here and telling me you need to pee all the time, I would tell you to stop drinking coffee. So some people are very intuitive in the ways that they treat their body. So the symptoms can definitely change. Um, they can, they can get worse as well, but they can get better because you're doing things to change it without even seeing a pelvic floor physio, right? Pelvic floor physios like myself, I, I gear a lot of what I do is towards educating the patient. And sometimes you just need someone to tell you what you should be doing. It's not all about digging our pointy elbows into your hips so that you feel better. Right? <laughs> but that's definitely part of it. So don't part don't, of it, but it's not all of it. <laughs> now the second question here is some of these symptoms are more specific than others. So do you use some of these symptoms as a very clear diagnostic like one, would you rank any as higher on the pelvic floor dysfunction scale versus lower? No, I mean, we have to look at all of the symptoms together. I would never okay. look at the symptoms individually. So for example, when I'm screening for pelvic floor tension, um, some of the things we screen for is constipation, difficulty um, starting the flow of urine, pain with insertion, a history of pelvic pain. But just because someone tells me they have constipation issues doesn't mean that they have pelvic floor dysfunction because for a lot of people it's diet related, um, it could be stress related, it could be, it could be a number of things, right? So you have to look at the big picture and put things together. And then you have to add the physical assessment to that as well to address where the issues might be coming from. Gotcha. Thank you. Right. Um, so for muscular, we're gonna look at trauma. Uh, trauma can have a huge impact on the pelvic floor. Cancer, for example, or example, any cancer in the pelvic area, um, ovarian cancer, cervical cancer. If you end up needing radiation over your pelvic floor, that has a huge impact on the pelvic floor muscles. And some th something that doctors, I find, not doctors, but the healthcare system misses with radiation over the pelvic floor is addressing um, sexual function after the fact and making sure that they can maintain function afterwards with the use of dilators, pelvic floor physio, all that fun jazz. Um, so it often gets missed. So, tra so cancer, trauma, um, abdominal surgeries, we talked about how uh, breathing mechanics impacts the pelvic floor. Well, when you breathe in, your abdominal contents shift down. If you have a lot of scar tissue around your abdomen, that's gonna affect your breathing mechanics as well. Previous joint injuries, 
We talked about biomechanics. If you have previous joint injuries, that can affect how you shift your weight. Um, it can affect if you have hip injuries, it can affect the pelvic floor because of those pelvic, those hip muscles that contribute to the pelvic floor. If you have accidents resulting in physical trauma, for example, if you've ever been bucked off a horse and broken your tailbone, we know that a lot of the pelvic floor muscles actually attach to the tailbone. So if you've broken your tailbone, well, obviously you're, you're affecting the anchor point of a bunch of your pelvic floor muscles. So that would have to be addressed. That would be in both men and women, correct? Both men and women, yeah. yeah. And finally, sexual trauma is a big one. When we talk about pelvic pain, um, sexual trauma has a huge impact on it and finding um, a therapist that's conscious of that is very important as well. Finally, not finally, uh, lifestyle would be the next thing. We've talked about lifestyle quite a bit, mental health, overall health, physical demands, nutrition, and exercise. Um, nutrition, if you're constantly eating poorly and you're constipated all the time, that can have a huge impact on your pelvic floor. Because if you're straining to go to the washroom all the time, that puts a lot of pressure on your pelvic floor muscles. If you have a high physical demand job and you're constantly putting pressure on your pelvic floor because you're not breathing properly, um, that's something that we need to consider. If you're ex exercising a lot, and let's say you're a high performance athlete, high performance athletes can carry a lot of tension in their pelvic floor because that's literally what they do. They're always on, they're always exercising. Um, so those are a few things that we would look at when it comes to lifestyle. And then pregnancy is a big one. Uh, the physical demands of pregnancy have a huge impact on your pelvic floor. Any complications from pregnancy, labor, and delivery. If you had really quick labors or labors that were too long, um, a lot. If you had episiotomies, if you had a C-section, those would all impact the pelvic floor. Perfect. Any questions before I move on? I think from the chat we're good right now. You all answered right. a lot of the questions that people have been asking so far, which is really great. Cool. All right, so all this to say, Kegels are not one size fits all. Um, you've probably heard it at some point in time. You can do your Kegels in the car. You can do them laying down. You had a baby, do Kegels all the time. No one's gonna know you're doing Kegels. Um, they're not for everyone. If you have tension in your pelvic floor, I definitely wouldn't recommend Kegels. If you're having trouble doing them and you don't know how to recruit your muscles, then just being told to do Kegels won't be helpful. You wouldn't go to the gym and just start lifting weights without anyone helping you out and telling you how to lift weights and how to deadlift and why would you do kegels without knowing how to properly engage all your muscles right that's a great uh correlation even though we do see some of our clients who, who do that but that's a big no-no it is a big no-no <laughs> so talk let's talk a little bit about pelvic floor physiotherapy so pelvic floor physio is the gold standard and should be the first line of defense for treating stress and urge urinary incontinence prior to considering surgery and medication. I didn't throw the medication in there. So the stress incontinence, we talked about it a little bit. If you cough, if you dribble when you cough, sneeze, laugh, um, exercise, that's the stress incontinence. Urge urinary incontinence is when um, you open the front door and you just can't make it fast enough to the washroom to go pee. So some people have some triggers. For example, um, anyone who pees in the shower a lot. This is the, the best example I could ever think of. If you pee in the shower a lot, and now every time you hear running water, you really need to pee because your brain has developed that association between um, the running water and your bladder emptying. So just don't pee in the shower, guys. Not just because it's unsanitary. But anyways. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah, that's a whole other webinar topic. <laughs> yes, but pelvic floor physio can address both those things, the stress incontinence and the urge incontinence. They're both addressed similarly, but with, with, and with differences as well, right? We would look at pelvic floor strengthening or lengthening as needed, but urge urinary incontinence, we would look at bladder irritants and how to manage bladder habits and fluid intake as well. We would do a biomechanical assessment to see how your breathing is impacting your pelvic floor, how your weight shifting is impacting your pelvic floor, Maybe you have weakness in your, your, uh, your hip muscles that needs to be addressed. So that would all be part of the biomechanical assessment. Um, assessment of the pelvic floor muscles, bladder and fluid habits, bowel function and internal exam are all part of a pelvic floor assessment. Um, pelvic floor physiotherapists are rostered to do internal exams. 
Um, that being said, it's always optional. If you don't feel comfortable with internal exam, never feel like you are obliged to do one because it won't give your therapist a lot of information if you're just anxious and tense throughout the whole exam, right? And there are other ways to find the information that we need to find if we need to. So um, assessment of the pelvic floor muscles with an internal exam, bladder and fluid habits. I have some patients fill out bladder diaries so that we can understand how often they're going through the washroom, but also what they're drinking that might be impacting their, their bladder. And then we'll assess bowel function in a similar way as well. Core strengthening is a really important part of pelvic, the pelvic floor. Your deeper core muscles actually contribute to pelvic floor strength. Uh, if you've ever done um, a deeper core exercise in Pilates or yoga, you might feel like your pelvic floor muscles are engaging, like you're kind of doing a Kegel. So pelvic floor muscles you're, um, are very intricately related to your deeper core. And finally, we would do pain management as well. And pain management is definitely a big one for pelvic floor physio. We see it a lot. Um, in postpartum and people who've struggled with chronic pelvic pain their whole life. Questions about that? No, I think that's a very good overview though. Okay. So let's talk, let's dive into pregnancy in the pelvic floor a little bit. Um, for pregnancy in the pelvic floor, there are a few things that we touch on. We do some prenatal care. Uh, what I usually tell people is that around the 23 week mark, come in and see a pelvic floor physio unless you have symptoms that come up earlier in your pregnancy. So if you're having pelvic pain earlier in your pregnancy, a hip pain, incontinence, um, let's say you've had a really awful bout of morning sickness at the beginning of your pregnancy and now you have no bladder control, then don't wait until the 23 week mark to come in and see us. You would wanna come in earlier than that. Prenatal care will look at um, labor prep. We'll talk about maintaining pelvic floor strength during the whole pregnancy, but also preparing for labor with um, lengthening of the pelvic floor muscles and just maintaining endurance and strength. Um, labor can be like a marathon. You can burn a lot of calories in the labor. You can do a lot of burning energy during the labor. So having someone kind of guide you through Proper muscle strengthening and endurance um, for prenatal care can be very important. So labor preparation, we touched on a little bit. Um, we do a lot of breathing exercises for labor prep. I do a lot of advocacy for my labor prep as well. So making sure women know that they don't have to labor on their back if they don't want to labor on their back, making sure that they're breathing properly um, for pushing and that they're not engaging their pelvic floor muscles when they're pushing as well. Um, that's a big thing that can cause your labor to stop progressing if you're not if you're not relaxing your pelvic floor muscles and being able to work on those things before labor before you're in the somewhat chaotic moment of labor can be very important what you mean labor <laughs> stressful oh my god no what a concept <laughs> um i had one patient last year who came back to me after she had her baby um who had a very straightforward labor and delivery, but she described it to me as fine, painful, like so painful, you can't even believe how painful it is, but it was fine. And I'm just going to remember that for the rest of my life now. Um, postnatal care is very important. Six weeks postnatal to see a pelvic floor physio to just work on strengthening. You might not have any complications after your labor. You might come back and say, I don't have incontinence. I don't have any issues. And that's totally fine. Um, but having someone just make sure that you're engaging the muscles properly to prevent any complications down the road, to prevent incontinence down the road, and to make sure that you're returning to exercise properly. You had a huge change in your body. Making sure that you're exercising properly after you have a baby can be very important. The same is also said, and it was kind of like your question about ACL versus pregnancy and sort of the rehab from that. Most people who do injure themselves and have a surgery scheduled are also told to properly strengthen and see a physio before they go um, and have the surgery. So the same thing and the same concepts for any type of major surgery or injury or body trauma um, 
is really something to consider. And 99% of the injuries we see are preventable with proper care in advance of an athletic event, of a surgery, of a pregnancy. So it really, when we say um, sort of injury or uh, incident or complication or whatever, if we take care of ourselves in advance, likely the rehab and the recovery is going to be a lot easier on your body um, when we do that kind of stuff. Yeah. So that's a great segue into prevention, right? If we can do preventative pelvic floor physiotherapy before you have the baby, before things get worse down the road, like I don't, I, I would love to reduce the amount of people who come in and see me 20 years after they've already been suffering with pelvic pain their whole life, after they've suffered with incontinence since I have people coming in who tell me as a kid, they were having incontinence and kidney issues and bladder issues, but they don't see me until their fifties or sixties. Let's say I saw them in their teens. Let's say I saw them in their early twenties. You have a huge change um, in their lifestyle and impact on quality of life. So prevention is very important as well. So uh, Sam, how come like this information really isn't discussed or shared by family doctors or gynos or obstetricians? Like is it because there's so much going on and they're really just focusing on the specific task at hand? Like, why isn't this as commonly shared or promoted um, throughout, throughout just like the general health education um, for women and, there, and men, to be honest? There isn't a straightforward answer to that. There's like, it's, it's layers and layers, right? So for one, pelvic floor discussions are very taboo. We don't like talking about the pelvic floor, um, despite the fact that, you know, maybe 5% of what I've discussed today is related to sexual function and intercourse. Most of it is not, yet we still don't like to talk about it because it's a very taboo subject. Um, that's one reason. Uh, two, we have a quite a disconnect in our healthcare system between uh, doctors and other healthcare providers. We don't see a lot, enough referrals. And I'm not saying this is all doctors we can't paint um, or even physios with all of us with the same brush. Uh, something that we do really well here that we don't see enough of in the outside world is internal referrals and referrals out. When you don't know how to treat something, send it to someone else. But oftentimes when we don't know how to treat something, we give it a name and say, this is normal, it's fine this is just your life now. So with pregnancy, for example, oh, you had a baby, it's normal for you to cough, to, to dribble now for the rest of your life, but it's not. So the reason why it's not out there, again, multiple reasons, we don't teach it to kids in high school before they go to university uh, so that they can understand how to treat their body better. Um, doctors don't talk about it to their patients enough. I, I do have great family doctors who say, oh, you had a baby, you got to go see a pelvic floor physio. So it's not everyone, but it's also it's not changing. everyone who refers out. It's changing. Yeah. yeah. I have a lot and more patients now who come in already knowing about pelvic floor physio, which is great. That's good. And I think that's one thing that uh, impresses me so much with Sama so far um, in the short time that she's been with us is her eagerness and sort of passion for connecting with a number of different healthcare providers MDs, gynos, doulas, midwives, like she's really taking on the challenge of networking with different healthcare providers and educating them. Because for so long, even in the, just the physiotherapy world alone, we don't share our knowledge as much to enhance and elevate the care of our clients because people are so worried about holding on to their caseload that they're often less inclined to share. And right from the get-go, Sam has made it, um, her sort of goal is to connect with everyone in the York region from a medical perspective who does have a stake or a, a touch point in uh, anyone's pelvic health journey. So I, I'm really impressed with that so far. And that really comes down to prevention and awareness. Thank you, Robin. All right. So just we're talking about pregnancy a little bit. Um, the first picture on the left there just shows you some exercises we can do for pregnancy. So just goes again towards to talk about that labor prep um, exercises to help with pelvic floor lengthening, but also getting baby in position um, and keeping mom nice and strong. Um, 
the labor positions, you can see it in the top right corner. There's a lot of positions that women can labor in. You've probably never seen these on social media or not social media because actually Instagram is getting a lot better for that, but um, like TV shows and movies. Laboring on your back is actually very counterintuitive. Um, so be, because it closes the pelvic inlet, makes it harder for baby to come out. Um, so being able to labor in different positions is very important and being able to discuss that with your OB or your midwife, midwives are great with this, um, is important as well. All right. Um, and doulas. Doulas can be very helpful. I've been chatting with doulas a lot more recently and having someone in the room whose sole purpose is to support you emotionally during labor and delivery can be huge because there's a lot going on. I hear a lot of stories of women coming back and saying, this is what I wanted to do, but this is what the doctor said and this is what went. But having an extra per voice for you in the room is very important. And doulas are great. Doulas tell you when to go to the hospital. Doulas kind of start pointing out when things aren't going the way they should be going. But they are also an extra pair of eyes in the room to tell you, you know what? The doctor is preparing for an episiotomy. Do you want an episiotomy? Um, and that way you can talk to the doctor when things are changing. So pelvic floor physio and doulas and midwives, we all work really well together. Um, and would definitely consider one if you are, are trying to get pregnant at any point in time. And Santa has a great list of referrals as well for her clients. So we're not just going to say, oh yeah, go find a doula on Google. Like we really pride ourselves in vetting quality providers who have the client centric uh, viewpoint. Um, so there are a ton of people that Sam has personally vetted um, to make sure that we can provide quality referrals where we need to. Yeah. All right. So we talked a bit about prostatectomy, so prostate issues. So more geared towards our males in the crowd. Um, prostatectomies, so prostate cancer is the most common type of cancer um, that men can get. And often the solution to prostate cancer is a radical prostatectomy. So a radical prostatectomy would involve kind of what it sounds like, radically removing the prostate. Um, but that surgery involves um, cutting through a lot of pelvic floor muscles. And if it's not properly rehabbed before and after, um, we can see a lot of incontinence. That's really the big one, incontinence after a prostate um, surgery, a prostate removal. And it doesn't get addressed. Again, just as urinary incontinence in females often doesn't get addressed, this can often go missed as well. Um, and it has a huge impact on quality of life. No one wants to wear a pad. No one wants to worry about smelling like urine. No one wants to stop doing the activities that they like doing because they're leaking now after surgery. So pelvic floor physio can help with the management of post-surgical stress urinary incontinence. Um, we can prescribe exercises before surgery and after surgery to improve the outcomes of your surgery. And we can help manage pelvic pain as well. So questions with that? Oh, I think that's very helpful. And also to, um, if there's any private questions that anyone to ask, wants to ask one-on-one -on -one to Sam, we'll be sharing her email after the session today. Yeah. So is this right for you? So we'll do our second poll now and we'll see if any of this rings true to anyone. Bear with me while I pull it up. Here we go. And you can check off more than one option for this one as well, you guys. Um, Sam, if you have surgery for a hernia just above the belly button or an umbilica hernia, does that affect the pelvic floor? I would argue that any abdominal surgery can affect the pelvic floor um, because of the scar tissue that um, would be as a result of the surgery. So hernias are a big one for sure. Um, but if the scar tissue isn't addressed properly, then 
It can limit the mobility of the tissues in the viscera around the stomach. If the scar tissue is right above uh, the bladder, it can make the bladder overly sensitive. Um, again, some of the scars that they make now though are like super small and pretty much non-existent. So it's not all abdominal surgeries. And this is where piecing together all the bits of the puzzle is important. Just because someone has an abdominal surgery doesn't mean that they'll necessarily have pelvic floor dysfunction. But if, if they've had a hernia and abdominal surgery and pelvic floor dysfunction, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's a coincidence. Like I would, I would check it out to see if it's contributing to their dysfunction. Awesome. So I think everyone answered. We're at 22 out of 24. So I'll end the poll now. Um, and then we'll look at the results. Okay, so dribbling when you cough, sneeze, laugh, or exercise, that went up to 32%. Um, we did have a couple participants um, join us a little bit later, but it's still quite an increase. So some of you are maybe coming to terms with uh, your pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, urgency to urinate so strong you can't control it. 32% of you, that's a lot of you, all right? Uh, urinating more than eight to 10 times a day. A few of you there too, waking at night to urinate, 41% of you answered that you get up at night to urinate. And I'm willing to bet that most of you are not in your 70s or 80s yet and should not be getting up at night to pee as of right now. So let's like sit on this one for a second. If you had someone who can fix the amount of times that you get up to pee at night and you could sleep through the night, imagine the impact that would have on your quality of life. I'm just going to leave that there for you guys. Yeah, if that's the only thing you take away from tonight, let's yes, make I can help you sleep better. Yeah. yeah. Um, difficulty emptying your bladder or starting the flow of urine, painful periods. Um, even that one, 23%. That's a lot of you. Uh, low back, hip, or tailbone pain, 36%. We know that we have a high percentage of low back pain um, because we all, most of us have seated desk jobs. Um, but important to consider if you're showing this symptom with a few of the other symptoms that it's probably related to pelvic floor dysfunction, um, and pain with intercourse or insertion. Again, we talked about this one in length, pelvic floor tension or, or long history of pelvic pain can contribute to this. So the percentage went up from earlier, which means I did my job. Um, a few of you realized you have pelvic floor dysfunction and you learned something new today. So I'm pretty happy. All right, we'll close the poll. So how can I help? How can a pelvic floor physio help? But more importantly, how can SAMA, Faramina, registered physiotherapist help? So um, I will uh, have an individualized approach. Everyone's different. I don't paint you all with the same brush. Um, some people will have different stressors or contributing factors. Some people have different goals. Some people don't care that they get up to pee at night, but they really wanna stop peeing every time they do jumping jacks at the gym. Um, my, one person might wanna to return to group walking classes while another might be training for a marathon. So you wouldn't use the same approach for these two people. You might use similar exercises, but definitely would, would use different approaches. Um, health history is very important in pelvic floor assessments. I spend a lot of time going through your health history um, your pelvic pain history, your gynecological history, really anything pertaining to the pelvic floor, but also your mental health history. We do a lot of education. I go through a whole PowerPoint um, that you guys got a little sneak peek of during my assessment so that even if you decided pelvic floor physio wasn't for you, you would at least leave the assessment understanding your body a little bit better. And that would be a successful assessment for my, in my books. Um, a biomechanical approach. This is huge, Hansberger. Um, we, we, we use the biomechanical approach with all of our patients. I have started implementing new approaches since I started here um, that have elevated my pelvic health game because I'm able to assess how the hip contributes to pelvic floor dysfunction a little bit better. Um, and the other nice thing too is if we find that there's contributing factors that maybe I'm not the best to help with, there is a whole team at the clinic that's always well-equipped 
to help with um, different conditions, right? If I have a high stress patient, I will send them to Becky across the hall to work on settling their nervous system. If I have someone who has a lot of abdominal issues, I will send them to Dan or Jason, the osteopaths and the AT to deal with visceral mobility. So there's always a whole team behind us at Hans Berger Physio, which is really nice. Um, and it's a very safe environment. Treatment rooms are always doors open here, unless um, we're doing a pelvic assessment, in which case the door is closed. Um, and there's never anything, so just to say that it's a, a safe environment for anyone to walk into, but also there's no such thing as TMI in my treatment room. Um, some people will come in whispering that they pee their pants and then I'm like, it's fine. We're gonna talk about a lot more today. So nothing's ever a TMI in a pelvic floor assessment. Um, and finally, I'm very flexible with my patients. Um, I don't, I won't give you 10 exercises to work on daily. If you think five is a good number for you, I'll give you five. If you think one is as much as you can do, then I will give you one. My new um, moms love this because sometimes one exercise is all they have time for between feedings and cleaning the house and all that fun jazz. So um, if you're still not sure and you have some questions, uh, you didn't want to ask questions today, or you're just a little bit shy, or you think of them later tonight while you're laying in bed and processing all the information that I gave you that's going to keep you up at night. Um, virtual consults are available that you can book. They're free 15-minute consultations, and we can dive into those questions a little bit more. All right. Any questions? We do have two um, in the chat, yeah. so let's start with those. And... Um, so how, so we kind of talked about surgery being the last resort for a lot of pelvic health related issues. So when is surgery prescribed and what is that last resort in your opinion? So if I've been working with someone for a really long time to help promote pelvic floor strengthening um, and they're still struggling with, so for prolapse, for example, we grade our prolapses from one to four. A grade four prolapse would be the pelvic organ prolapsing out of the vaginal canal. If that's at a grade four, then I send them straight to a surgeon for a consult. I don't wait. Um, if we're from a grade one to three, then we try pelvic floor strengthening. If symptoms are managed at that point, then I would say, okay, no surgery. If we've been working at it for a while and symptoms aren't coming under control um, and quality of life is seriously affected, then I would consider um, sending them to see their gynecologist, then get a referral to see a surgeon. Um, that being said, all the work that they do prior to a referral to see a surgeon hasn't gone to waste because all that pelvic floor strengthening that they do beforehand helps with the recovery after the fact. Perfect. Um, and how long would you wait to do pelvic floor physio after hernia surgery? Um, as long as the incision is healed, I would say I'd probably leave it at the same mark for as a um, pregnancy. So six weeks. And also, obviously, if you get clearance from your surgeon, then that that's OK as well. So it really depends on the guidance from who's done the surgery, just like any other uh, yeah. knee, shoulder, elbow, uh, that kind of thing. Once you get the thumbs up to start your rehab, that would be the time that uh, Sam would be able to step in. Yeah. So I will say for hernias, um, they probably get prescribed rehab even less than um, pregnancy does. So for anyone who had a hernia who's like, who isn't sure and they think they need pelvic floor physio, um, six weeks is probably around the same time that the surgeon says you're all clear, go do, go wild, go nuts, do whatever you want to do. Um, and six weeks would be a safe time to come and see us as well. Perfect. Now, another question. Is it normal to wake up to pee like 30 minutes before your alarm is supposed to go off? Is that considered waking during the night if it's like 7.30 to 8 a.m.? Now, Beth, bless you. I wish I could sleep as long as 7.30 to 8 a.m. So um, I'm super jealous about that. But that's yeah. a really good question because um, a lot of people have been asking the same thing. Yeah, so getting like half an hour before alarm, it really depends on a what time you went to bed at as well. Um, so if you're getting less than seven hours of sleep to get and you're getting up to pee, that's when I would say you're getting up at night to pee. If you're sleeping more than seven hours, um, you're between the eight to nine hour mark, you're probably fine. 
Um, and again, it depends on what you did the night before. If you happen to be out with your group of friends, your, your girls, you're drinking wine, your guys drinking beer or vice versa, whatever it is that you like to drink. Um, and you had a lot to drink before the night before, then yeah, you're going to get up to pee right before your alarm. If it's consistently right before your alarm and you're not getting seven hours of sleep, then I would say um, there's probably some lifestyle changes that we can work on to just get that last little bit of sleep. Perfect. I think those are it for now. Um, is there anyone else who'd like to unmute themselves to ask a question um, or anything that we didn't cover tonight that's really sort of nagging at you? And before Speak now or forever hold your pee, right? Before. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I've been I've been waiting for that one. <laughs> that was a good one. Before you log off as well, um, my contact information is on there. Um, I did um, cave to social pressures and make an Instagram account as well that you guys can follow me on. Um, and resources, a lot of the stuff we talked about, you can find on a, a PDF that you will load up if you scan that QR code. So if you're missing any of the information, if you went to pee in the middle of this um, webinar and didn't bring your phone with you or your computer and you missed something, most of it is in this PDF and you can access it at home. Just remember to save the PDF as well. And, and we'll remember probably... everybody too, yeah, we will post this. This will be live on YouTube and it also will be loaded onto our new pelvic health physiotherapy education uh, portal as well. So we will be sending everybody an email who registered by end of day tomorrow with a recording, with um, the link to book your free 15 minute consultation with Sam's email and with a few other links to some great resources. So um, big thank you to Sama. A round of applause for you uh, for sharing everything tonight. I personally learned a lot. I learned something every time I chat with you. So big thanks to you and big thanks to all of our uh, attendees tonight. We had 26 people in the house. So that's absolutely amazing. Um, and we hope you all have a great evening and we look forward to seeing you soon.